It's better business to clean water than to pollute it. It's cheaper to reuse and recycle than to make new and throw it away. And those companies who work with good values always attract the best people. I used to believe that sustainability was expensive, and I used to believe that companies who extort cheap labor in poor countries make more money. But when I was 19, I left Sweden, I went to Nepal. I've been living there for 13 years. And living in Nepal has made me realize and rethink everything. It made me understand that what's important, it's not about having a fancy mobile or a beautiful cool car. What's really important is to have clean water in your tap that you can drink whenever you want without getting sick. I lived in the beginning together with a group of Nepalese orphans. We lived in central Kathmandu, nearby the river. The river in Kathmandu is a sewage. It's where all the garbage is collected. And a few hundred meters from where we were living, there was a construction site where these three women were working. Their job here is that they carry sand across the river. They take sand from the riverbed, they pack it on bags to take on their heads. They walk through the river, up through a pile of garbage, and deliver it to a huge construction site. And then they go back for more. They work there from sunrise till sunset every day, seven days a week. They walk through a river that is full of sewage, that is full of garbage, that's full of broken glass. They have nothing but slippers on their feet. And I saw this happening day after day after day. And when I'd been in Nepal for two months, I just couldn't take it anymore. I went down to the river and I started asking some questions. And one of these women told me that the reason why she was there working is she had a dream. She had a dream that one day she was going to be able to make enough money so she could put her children through school. Her two kids were sitting a little bit further away on the construction site, playing with the cement. And it just felt that that dream of hers seemed so impossible. And it was at that time when she told me that her biggest dream in her life is something that I have always taken for granted. That I felt like I, I have to do something. So I gathered my friends and we started a recycling company. We decided to recycle the garbage, create a company that gives jobs to people who don't have good jobs. But when it was time to sign the employment contract, that's when I realized that most of my employees had no idea how to read and write. Another basic human right that had been denied to them. I didn't know what to do, but we found there was a school nearby, so we hired a teacher. She came every morning, one hour before work, and taught everyone to read and write. This literacy class cost me 20 euros per month to teach 15 people to read and write. And I thought I was doing something good, but it turned out that this was the single most profitable investment that I've ever done. I never made so much money from anything, because it changed the very basic on how the company worked when we went from verbal instructions in my broken Nepali to we could write things down and everyone had the same idea. A year later, we had bought a blackboard and put it in the production room and we wrote down, like, we're going to produce this, this, this much and it's going to be finished by that date. And everyone could read it. And that was the first day that everyone in the company had the same idea of what they were going to do and when they were supposed to finish it. It was the first time we met any of our deadlines. And it made me realize that sustainable is profitable if you do it the right way. But the thing is that here in... Europe, we tend to make things so complicated. We need to write policy documents, we make CSR reports. And I'm not saying that is wrong, but I'm saying that if you want to build a sustainable company, it is not enough to make a policy. It's also not about giving away a small percentage of your profit to some, someone who's doing something good. The real question is, how do you make that profit? It is about getting sustainability to become a part of your company's DNA. The, the thing that makes us what we are. And to do that, you have to start by asking yourself two questions. What is it that we are selling? And how does our product and service contribute to the society? Are we solving real problems that people need? Or are we just creating an overconsumption? And if we are, it's not about being afraid and it's not about hiding from it. It's about thinking, how can we use our knowledge and our skill to change and make sure that we do make something that's making a difference? And the second question is, how do we produce it? Are we 
using materials that can be reused and recycled? Or are we taking new things and you make it and then throw it away? And I think that it is those companies who dare to question how they're producing things, who dare to change the production model, who dare to replace their materials, and those who have the guts to invest their time and money in developing real solutions to real problems that's going to make a real difference, then and only then will sustainable be profitable. But what's important to understand here is that we live in a world that is changing and the rules are completely changing. The weather is changing. The climate is becoming unstable. We live in a world where there are hundreds of millions of people who don't have access to clean water. At the same time, communication is spreading. In Nepal today, in the remotest of the remote villages, where there are no roads to get to, where there are no hospitals, where there is barely a school, people are sitting with mobile phones and communicating. And this changes everything. I had an interview with a, uh, for a production manager one day. And I met this guy, he was telling me he had worked in a textile factory who was delivering uh, clothes to some of the big European brands. I was pretty impressed, he had a long experience, he had handled hundreds of staffs. And I asked him that, during your time as a production manager, did you ever ha have any problems with your staffs? No, not really, he said. He had no problems with hundreds of staffs? And later on I asked him, like, so why do you want to leave your current job and why are you here? So no, the factory has been closed down. Okay, why was it closed? Well, there was a few guys that were always dissatisfied that the, the company was just paying less than minimum wage. And then they hadn't paid the salary on time, it was a few months late. And then they gathered up with the villagers who were really pissed off because the company had been polluting the river that was running through the village. And they burned down the factory. And that's why I'm here looking for a job. This is the guy who had no problems with his staffs. He didn't get the job. But there is something very interesting to learn from his story. Because this factory had been standing there in that village and producing clothes and textiles for 20 years without any problems. But what worked 20 years ago doesn't work today. It doesn't work to pollute the, uh, the water when water is a scarce resource, when you don't have enough of it anymore. And it doesn't work to extort cheap labor when everyone, even in the remote villages, all of a sudden have access to communication and can organize. They won't accept it and shouldn't accept it. But imagine instead a factory who thinks the opposite, a factory who cleans the water instead of polluting it. Imagine a factory treating their laborers and the workers with respect. They will never be an enemy of the society. They will be someone that you trust, and they will be able to work and operate profitably for a long time. And I think it is all about changing their perceptions. But there are so many things changing right now. And living in a country like Nepal and in Asia is amazing. We have so much to learn from those that we call developing countries, and they are developing. It's changing so fast. When I came to Kathmandu in 2001, there lived about a, a, one million people in the Kathmandu Valley. Today there is somewhere between three to four million. And to see what happens when like two, three million people move into the city in so short time. I mean, the infrastructure has collapsed. The roads are completely broken. Nothing works. We have 12 to 16 hours of power cut in the capital every day because there is not enough electricity for everyone when everyone moved in and started wanting to have gadgets and more fancier machines. Development has not had the time to even keep up. But at the same time, this development that's happening, it sounds chaotic, it is chaotic, but it's beautiful. Because something amazing is happening. I have been, had the honor to live in a country and see how poverty is reduced by more than 25% in 10 years. You see things every year getting a little better. You see salaries increasing, how solar panels are being placed on the roofs. You see people installing the, uh, water purifiers in the restaurants and in their houses. You see more and more girls going to school and not only graduating basically but taking the university degree. This is amazing. It is a development so beautiful and it's happening all over Asia. But at the same time, we should realize that if everyone were to live like us Europeans, we need two and a half planets to sustain our lifestyle. And studies show that in 15 years from now, 
there's going to be approximately 3 billion people in Asia that's going to belong to the middle class. That's more than twice the population of the United States and Europe together. And what do you think is going to happen when 3 billion Chinese, Nepalese and Indians will demand to have the same things that we have? What do you think happens when they want to take the airplane and go for a holiday? What happens when they want to own their own car? When they want to have a big screen TV and heated houses? Then the planet can't take it anymore. And what I think is so interesting is to see like this development is happening. There's nothing we can do about it. But it's also important to realize the amazing opportunities that comes with it. I believe that when this happens, there is going to be a scarcity, just like there is in Kathmandu today, of electricity, of resources, of raw material. And this means that those who can adapt to this changed reality, they're going to be the winners. Those who can start producing their products from recycled materials, those who can make sure that when you no longer need it, you can recycle it and use, use the material again. Those who can produce with less energy, in smarter ways, with better materials, they will be the ones leading the future. Two years ago, Bina, my wife and I, started a cleaning company in Kathmandu. Cleaning companies traditionally pay very bad to their staffs and offer pretty bad job opportunities. So we set out to do the exact opposite. We started a cleaning company where we employ people from poor backgrounds. We give them a training, teach them how to clean and how to work efficiently. And then we equip them with modern cleaning machines, teach them to work efficiently. And we pay them much more than our competitors. Once they complete six months working in the company, we also pay for the education of their children to make sure that if you work in this company, you will fulfill that dream. Your children will go to school. And you might think, well, this is all great, but it's going to end up having a lot higher expenses in the company. That may be true, but the real result is that we have a company with way higher efficiency than any other cleaning company in the country. Because we have staffs that work equally hard if there is a supervisor monitoring them or if he or she is not there. We have staffs who care about the machines and make sure that they don't break, who give their 120% each and every day and try to make things better. What our competitors deliver in a few days, we deliver in a few hours. And then it doesn't matter much if we have to pay a little bit more to our, our staffs. And this is how modern companies must work. Because it's not efficient to work with minimum wage. It creates only problems and inefficiency. If you want to build a modern company, if you want to build a profitable company, you have to focus on efficiency, and you get efficiency not by squeezing your staff, but by investing in your staff. Sustainable is profitable, and I believe that the future belongs to those who dare to take responsibility today. Thank you. <laughs>